Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahavir Yang Karavavahai Tejas Vinavadi Tamastu Mavid Vishavahai Aum Shantihi 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 Aum Svarge loke nabhayang king chanasti na tat pratvang na jaraya bibheti ubheti rtva shanaya pipase shokati go modate svarga loke In heaven there is no fear. You are not there, and nobody is struck with fear because of old age. Having transcended both hunger and thirst and crossed over sorrow, one rejoices in the heavenly world. So uh, let's go through Shankaracharya's tika on this verse. Swarge loke in the heavenly world. Bayankinchana ana asti. There is no fear whatsoever, fear arising from disease, etc. And, Tvam, you, O death, Natatra, are not there. You do not exert your might there all of a sudden. So unlike what happens in this world, there, Jaraya, because of old age, Nabibeti, nobody shudders at you. Moreover, Ubhe ashanaya pipase tirtva. Having transcended both hunger and thirst, and shokatigaha, having crossed over sorrow, being free from mental unhappiness, one modate rejoices, svargaloke, in the heavenly world. So this is the beginning of Nachiketa's second boon. He's already asked for the first boon to straighten up everything with his father, and death has granted that. So now we get to the second boon, which is a little more serious. <laughs> you know, but it shows Nachiketa's character. <clears throat> that first he took care of his duties to his family, to his father, to Dharma, and to death himself. But now he's asking for something personal. He's asking for some knowledge that will benefit him personally, that will allow him to retain immortality. And I want to highlight the difference between this concept of swarga and the concept of swarga in the Puranas. But first, I want to look at the second verse. O death, such as you are, you know the fire that leads to heaven. Tell that to me, who am full of faith. The dwellers of heaven get immortality. This I ask for as the second boon. And Shankaracharya's tika. Mrityo, O death, since sahatvam, you, such as you are, adyeshi, remember, that is, no. Svargyam Agnim, the fire that is the means of the attainment of heaven, heaven that is possessed of the qualities aforesaid. Therefore, Tvam, you, Prabhuti, speak. Mahyam Shradadhanaya, to me who am full of faith and who pray for heaven, tell me of that fire by worshipping which Svargaloka. The dwellers of heaven, those who have got heaven as their place of attainment, the sacrificers, bhajante, get, amritatvam, immortality, divinity. That fact which is etat, this knowledge of fire, vrne, I seek for, dvitiena varena, through the second boom. 
So now things are getting interesting. <laughs> you know, but the previous aforesaid part of the story was necessary for setting the context. I mean, how do you uh, create a uh, social linguistic context that is appropriate for the discussion of attaining heaven and immortality and all of this. You know, these things are only properly spoken of with God because no moral being actually knows, is that? We forget what happens in between lives. So the Shastra, like the uh, latter part of the Vedanta Sutra, have to remind us in detail what happens when the soul leaves the body. And this is going to be Nachiketa's third boon. Just wait. <laughs> it's going to get really deep here in a minute. But this one, he wants to uh, ascertain his own personal salvation. See, after taking care of his father and his family and all his social duties and religious duties and so on, properly, in sequence, he asks for his own personal benefit. May I attain enlightenment? May I reach heaven? May I get immortality? Now, the immortality that is spoken of here, amrita, huh, means freedom from death. But we know that nothing which is of form is free from death or dissolution. So what he's asking here highlights the difference between the way svarga, the term svarga, is used in the original Vedas and thus the Upanishads by extension, because the, the Upanishads are simply kind of the commentary on the meaning of the Brahmanas, uh, which are the ritualistic portion of the Vedas. In the Vedic usage, it means immortality. It's a synonym for immortality. But in the Puranic usage, which is, you know, uh, pretty much universally agreed on as being later uh, than the Vedas and Upanishads, that usage uh, describes a heaven which is temporary. It's not immortality. It may be a very extended lifetime, but it's not forever. <clears throat> Certainly not until the end of the manifested universe. Huh? That's what immortality really means. So-called immortality really means <clears throat> to create a form in a dhamma or a loka that permits it or will support it that lasts from now until the end of the universe, the maha kalpa or the maha pralaya at the end. That's a different kind of immortality than uh, the immortality uh, envisioned by people who want to go to heaven, which is sim simply an extended lifespan in a heavenly place. But um, the real immortality, <laughs> a third kind of immortality, is moksha, or realization of one's unity with the spirit, with consciousness, with Brahman. Because this is forever. Brahman is unborn and undying, primeval, meaning it was there before the beginning <laughs> and will be there after the end of the creation. Uh, and certainly underlies everything, is the foundation for everything. Uh, sometimes within the universe, this is called virat. And Shankaracharya will bring up this term in future uh, tikas that uh, all pervading pure consciousness, which is everywhere and in everything, and can be perceived by one in an enlightened state. This is what I perceived back in 1984 in Portland when Ma gave me the vision of the virat, the universal form that aspect of God which is omnipresent, pure intelligence or pure consciousness. And this is his natural form. 
Now, when he comes into the manifestation as Shiva or the Rudras, so what to speak of Brahma and Vishnu, the creator and maintainer of the universe, respectively, he puts on a form which is good for the duration of the universe. And that's all. That's all. Although Sada Shiva's form, I mean, there's really no need to manifest it except right at the beginning of the universe and right at the end. After that, it's like, who cares, right? <laughs> Everything is pure Brahman. But while the creation exists, there has to be some form, some means of communication, like an interface between Shiva in his natural form or formless form, huh? which, by the way, is the meaning of the lingam, and his bodily form, which is the meaning of the Shiva deity, uh, the murti of Shiva as a person, you know, sitting there with his trident or whatever. We know so many of those wonderful poses of Shiva. And what he does is he shows the standard of knowledge, of nobility, of conduct, of compassion, of kindness, broad-mindedness, wisdom, appropriateness, and so on. So what Nachiketa is asking for here is no less than a means of sacrifice, of Vedic uh, sacrifice necessary to elevate one to this platform of immortality within the presently manifested universe. Death is one of those immortals. He is a form and expansion of Shiva, the son of the sun god, Vivasan. So he's sometimes called Vivasan, meaning the son of Vivasan. And he lives for the duration. But an important point here is Nachiketa says, you are not there. You're not in the pure creation. You're not in the part of Swarga that exists forever. You are down here in the heavenly planets with all the temporary demigods, like basically Indra and all his followers and, and so on. So what is death doing here? Why is he why is an immortal coming down and like that to deal with the death life cycle that all mortal beings go through in between their embodiments. You know, we talked about how of the five bodies, the food body, energy body, mind body, intelligence body and consciousness body only the food body actually dies. The other four move as a unit into a between life state, which is located in Svapna consciousness. And this is where the so-called last judgment takes place, where actually the soul, as Sushupti, as <laughs> Shiva, as death, evaluates the dharmic value of the previous lifetime and what would be a just consequence of that. In other words, what kind of a bodily form and in, in what kind of situation one should take one's next birth. This is something everyone has gone through millions of times, but we don't remember it because of the, the birth trauma. So the birth trauma is so heavy that it creates amnesia of the pre-birth experience in the womb and before that in Svapna consciousness. And maybe if someone is very fortunate, they can pass over the world of dreams and get to Sushupti, the void, which is Shiva. And see, this is the advantage of developing a devotional consciousness for all these things. You don't see the void as nothing. You see it as the bodily presence or bodily material, if you will, of Shiva. Because he's the destroyer. He is the one who who burns up the material creation at the end. Huh? Just like, oh yeah, I wanted to mention this. Before I go to sleep at night, 
you know, I closed my outward eyes and I opened my inward eyes. <laughs> and I reversed the flow from the senses uh, to point back to the source, to the self. And so what I see, for a long time, I had difficulty understanding what I was seeing. It's like, um, well, imagine a big forest fire that, that starts as a little blaze and then gradually spreads over like a whole range of hills until the whole thing is burning brightly. And then it gradually burns itself up and fades into embers and then disappears. And what is left is only the void. So what is happening here is that by this visualization, which, by the way, I don't make, it just happens, right? I see the material world burning up, like Buddha says, burning up, oxidizing itself away, you know, or living until it dies and then evaporating afterwards. I mean, isn't this the material world? Isn't this how it works? And then, of course, what is left is only space. And the thing that we forget, because we live in a world that has upadis, has limits, what we forget is that space is fundamentally unlimited. There are no boundaries in space. That's what space is all about. Huh? Here, in real emptiness... There's no gravity, there's no radiation, there's no energy, there's nothing to mark a location or measure anything by anything else, you know? It, it's really complete emptiness. and Nothing can become in that emptiness because there's no raw materials of being. Huh? This is like the universe before the creation of the cosmic egg, Hiranyagarbha, or Virat. Uh, there was no need for them, so they didn't exist at that time. But what, the, what was was just a vast, unlimited expanse of nothing. This is Sushupti. See? This is the, the uh, quantum ground state from which everything can be derived. But anyway, I'm running out of time. And this is a deep discussion, which we will continue in the future episodes. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.